Okay, very nice. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leila Zia. I'm the head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you so much for coming to this session. As uh, If you're joining in the room or watching live now or in the future, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to share with you um, some research findings um, from the work of the team, the research team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And um, I have prepared 10 of them, uh, but um, really the purpose here for me is to help you engage with the research. So if we end up covering fewer of them, from my perspective, it's okay. Um, so I'm going to be asking you at points to, you know, pull up your phone or laptop if you want to engage with some of the research findings more live we can do that together my um, you know we we have a lot of venues um, through which we communicate research findings in some of these venues we go really in a lot of in-depth explanation about the research behind the projects for this particular session for wikimania our priority is to make sure you understand what is the research that is happening like what are, what are the findings that we have and how can you use the, those in your work if you're interested about you know the research behind the scenes then i'll share some links at the end how you can engage more with the research itself if you want to get into the depth of the technical side of it um, very briefly about the mission of the research team the research team at the foundation is a team of 16 staff members so we were smaller and as a result of research reorganizations we are now bigger um, we have five contractors, one research fellow, and 17 what we call formal collaborators. These are researchers who are in, usually in academic institutions across the world, who volunteer and work with us towards the annual plan um, commitments of our team and the organization. Our mission as a team is to develop models and insights. And the way we differentiate the work that we do with a lot of the other research that is happening, whether within the organization or in the movement, is that we put an emphasis on using scientific methods. Uh, so for us, contributing to the scientific literature and also using scientific methods is important. And the other part of our mission is uh, our focus on strengthening the research community around the Wikimedia projects. Uh, we do this work for two primary impact um, areas. One is that we want um, to support the technology or policy needs of the Wikimedia projects. So usually when we are doing research projects, we look at where can, where can it help, right? And we are looking at the technology space as well as the policy space. And you know, what policy is broadly defined, it can be some of the work that, that is happening within the Wikimedia Foundation. It can be policies that the communities continue to evolve and create, and we would like to with our work where it's possible, inform that. And the other area of impact that we seek is that we would like to advance the understanding of the Wikimedia projects. Whether it's within our movement or whether it's outside of the movement, we see as part of our job to help people understand the Wikimedia projects and Wikimedia communities better. We serve four primary audiences. Of course, we serve Wikimedia Foundation uh, we also serve affiliates, and this is something that we are putting more and more focus on. Traditionally, we have worked, of course, with Wikimedia Deutschland through Wikidata, and you will see some of the research that we have done with the Wikidata team. Um, and now we are having other conversations with some of the other affiliates. We are generally very interested to work with organized groups because we can have more impact together. We also serve Wikimedia volunteer developers, or we would like to do more of that, um, and that's through bringing research expertise to volunteer developers for the tool building and the development that they do on the Wikimedia projects. And last but not least, uh, we serve the Wikimedia research community. This serving has two angles. One is that we listen to the needs of the Wikimedia research community. For example, if they ask for publishing data sets or a particular line of research to be done. And the other thing is that we try to strengthen this community by bringing researchers who are out there but are not part of our community and help them be part of the Wikimedia research community. Uh, we have three primary programs within the team and areas of focus. One is what we call address knowledge gaps. This is really an area of work of research that is focused on defining what are the different types of gaps on the Wikimedia projects, measuring them, and helping address and bridging them. The other one is what we call improving knowledge integrity. This is about the reliability and quality of content on the Wikimedia projects, 
we primarily at the moment see our role in this space as supporting volunteer editors or volunteers in general for enforcing content policies on the project or updating policies. And the last part of our work is focused on strengthening the Wikimedia research community, and that's more around, we do a lot of you know, event organization, publication, speaking in conferences and academic venues, and that's the way that we engage with this community and strengthen it. If you want to ever you know, do a deeper dive about what we do, we publish a biannual uh, report every six months, and you can find that on research.wikimedia.org, um, the, the report tab. Okay, so now I'm gonna go start uh, sharing some of the findings with you. Um, for those of you who have been regular Wikimania attendees, um, you will see some continuation and updates on projects that in the past you have heard about. The first one is about gaps. So we have been talking about gaps starting 2018. Uh, so this is an update uh, on, the, on years of work that has been happening since then. Um, so I wanna encourage you to start like thinking about knowledge gaps on the Wikimedia projects. And just before I go to the next slide, maybe take a minute to see if you can name three different types of content gaps that you think we have on Wikipedia, three different kind of readership gaps or reader gaps, and three kind of contributorship or contributor gaps. And if you want, just raise your hand, say one gap that you know. What is one gap type that you have heard about or you're working on? What kind of gaps do we have when we say we have something missing? Yep, Martin. Youth, okay. Citations, okay. Vocational knowledge, mm -hmm. Gender, okay. And this is on the, and these were partly on the content, but it also can be on the contributor. And uh, I don't know, Martin, Martin, when you said youth, whether it goes on the contributor end. So we have a lot of gaps on the projects. In fact, in 2019, 2020, we developed what we call a taxonomy of knowledge gaps for the Wikimedia projects. There are three main areas that we are considering readers, contributors, and content for this taxonomy. And for each of these, we have identified certain types of gaps. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but basically the way we have done this is that we read more than 200 academic and community publications on the topic of gaps. And we also talked with the different community members to understand what are the different kinds of gaps that they're trying to address. You in fact see some of them. So Martin, for example, what you mentioned is in either content age or recency or in contributor side and or reader side, we have age. And of course, there are other types of gaps that exist. So the, the problem that we are trying to solve with this taxonomy and the measurements is that there are numerous types of gaps on the Wikimedia projects. And in the absence of laying out all of these gaps, what usually happens on the decision maker side is that they hear about certain types of gaps and they assume that these are the only kind of gaps that we have. So there's a bias that you can try to break to some extent or mitigate if you can lay out what are all the different types of gaps that we should consider. So part of the attempt of building this taxonomy is to break this assumption that we have only a few different types of gaps. Once you have the taxonomy and you have defined the gap types, then the question becomes, can we measure these gaps? Um, and what are the metrics that we should define for each of them? Why is this important? Um, it is important because it can help us as decision makers and decision maker is broadly defined. It can be an affiliate trying to figure out what is the next project for their affiliate to work on, or it can be a tool developer who's trying to figure out what is the most impactful tool to develop next. We want to help decision makers identify areas of focus and impact. We want to diversify the investments across the movement so that we don't end up putting all of our resources in one area, at least not, not knowingly. It can be that we know it and we decide to do it, but that's different. And also we provide a way for all of us to monitor the impact that we have for these areas that we wanna focus on. Um, so we have developed a taxonomy. We have metrics for many of the gaps um, that exist um, that we have defined. And we have started providing measurements for some of these gaps. Um, this research is a multi-year research, it has gone on for multiple years and we expect it to continue measuring and providing measurements for each of these gaps requires significant amount of uh, 
time and deliberation. Um, we had a wonderful team that has worked on this project for multiple years. And you can now learn about the state of knowledge gap metrics in these li links that are provided here. There is a pre-recorded Wikimania presentation that is linked in that meta page that is in the bottom of the slides. And you know, if you want to go deeper in the topic of knowledge gaps and taxonomy, I highly recommend that you check that out. So I have one announcement to make here, which is you can now access um, the measurements for four of the content gaps um, that we had defined. These are content gaps for gender, age, geography, and sexual orientation. We compute these on a monthly basis, and they are published um, publicly. You can go and check them. Um, and uh, we have recently added one more um, content gap, which is multimedia gap. This one is not refreshed monthly yet. yet. We are hoping to be able to refresh it on a monthly basis as well. So that means on the content front, we have five gaps covered so far. Yes, there you go. Um, so multimedia gap, um, yeah, the metric is um, defined around whether an article, what, which percentage of articles contain images um, on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, so I want to also mention something that as you go to these links that are being shared here, um, you're going to run into CSV files um, or data that is published publicly, basically for raw data to be used. And we acknowledge that not everyone is comfortable, particularly within the decision maker cohorts. Not everyone is comfortable working with CSV files and raw data in that way. We see a long path ahead of us to make this data actually accessible to all of you who are decision makers. We have started experimenting with notebooks. So these are pause notebooks that once the slides are shared, you can click on them and you can go there. But for two of the gaps, um, the content gap, geography and content gap, gender, we have started developing pause notebooks where you can go and actually see some of the questions that we have asked and we have queried basically the data and we have prepared some plots that you can, you can access and um, learn more about. Um, as I mentioned, I expect us to spend significant amount of time just making this data more accessible to all of you as decision makers. So if you're interested to be in that journey with us, ask the type of questions, share the type of questions you want to be asking from this data and all that, please reach out to me after the session um, because I would like to get in touch soon. Um, so we did all this work. What are some of the things that we can learn today that we couldn't learn before or we couldn't confidently learn before? I'll share with you some sample findings. Um, one is a really nice news about um, gender of content. So. Articles about um, underrepresented um, gender groups, um, women, non-binary in, uh, in this case, um, have a much lower coverage on all Wikipedias. However, what we are seeing in the data is that the quality of these articles have actually become the overall quality and average volume of page views for these articles have been surpassed the other types of um, biographies of articles basically for men that exist on Wikipedia. So this kind of analysis, well, this kind of data sharing allows us to you know, plot these kinds of things and see that actually starting 2021, we are seeing that articles about underrepresented groups are having higher quality. Um, this is, I, I think for any of you in, the, in this um, room that are contributing to the gender of the content on Wikipedia, um, congratulations, thank you so much for years of work that you have done. Uh, we all know that quality of articles are very important, so it's not just about adding new articles, but it's about improving the quality of articles. And we are now able to see this kind of trends and patterns and see that the effect of the work that you all have been doing over the years. Um, another thing, just you know, uh, as, as a sample kind of thing that you can do with this data, um, we know that the proportion of articles about underrepresented regions such as Africa or Asia um, or Southeast Asia is low on Wikipedia. But uh, what we see is that um, the coverage of articles in these regions is growing faster than the other regions. Um, and that is a good news. So if you see here, for example, you see some numbers around 8%, uh, 9%. And up here for uh, US and South America, you see around 6%. Again, this is something to keep an eye on. These differences look small as numbers, 
but they're at least showing that there's a difference between how much uh, articles are being created about the region. Some of which can be that because there, you know, there can be saturation of uh, content that is created in a particular region, but it's good pattern to watch out and just keep an eye on and be aware of as we are making decisions about where to invest or we want to see, get a sense of what happened to the investments we have done so far. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the second topic. Maybe I'll just take a minute here. If there are any pressing questions about the gaps, uh, please ask. Tillman, will you be able to move? Yeah, thank you. Just wondering um, about these observatories. Um, there are some existing efforts right, by the community. For example, there's this um, it's called the Wikipedia Diversity Observatory, which was built some years ago. Has a lot of different dimensions. Seems to be a bit of overlap. Uh, but the question is more general: How do you decide when um, how to integrate with existing efforts from the community or the academic researchers? In that case, it's both with Mark Miguel, who also presented today, um, or when to build something new yeah. on your own. Yeah, thank you so much. And actually, Mark Mikkel was on this project, so we had extensive conversations with Mark about this. On, the, on this particular example that you mentioned, we decided not to join effort because there are some challenges around licenses of the data that is being used, and we want to make sure that the data that we publish are, is we can put it under a license properly, so we decided not to go with it. But in general, when we are deciding whether to do something or not, we because we have done the literature review and state of community work in this space, we generally try to bring the community in and just work with them on this front or figure out if we can reuse what they have already done because it doesn't make sense to recreate everything from scratch. But sometimes we have reasons not to continue or not to use the community resource that may be available. Okay, um, so now let's, uh, from the macro level of metrics and measurements and gaps and all that, let, let's uh, look at another project. Um, I would like to drill down with you on edits. And before I show you some of the next slides, I want to ask you to think about, um, so this is about Wikipedia, so if you, ha if you edit Wikipedia, think about the last edit that you have done on Wikipedia and think about what kind of edit was it? What did you do when you edited that Wikipedia page or talk page or anything like that? Revert. Revert. Very good. What did you revert? Vandalism. Vandalism. Okay. Any other examples? Yeah. Translate. Translate. Okay. You, you basically added content to a discussion page, right? Yeah. Rosie. New page patrol. Perfect. Okay. So we do different things when we edit Wikipedia and on, in different pages. Um, so the problem that we have is that we don't have a shared taxonomy of edit types for categorizing editor actions. Uh, we all talk about different things that we do, but we don't have a shared taxonomy. And even if we have that taxonomy, we don't have a way, or we didn't have a way, for automatically assigning edits to this taxonomy. Um, we are trying to solve for this problem. We are trying to define a standard way that we talk about edits, what we call te the taxonomy of edit types. And then we are also building systems that can help us automatically detect what kind of an edit is an edit across all Wikipedia languages. So why is this problem important? Because if we can solve this problem, we can answer some of the questions we may have. For example, what type, what type of edits newcomers do? Or what type of edits are most common in my language? How has it changed over time? What kind of edits get reverted more often? Or um, we can support patrollers better in patrolling the content because we can help them focus on specific types of edits or specific types of the flow that is coming in. And we, you know, there are plenty of applications here. We can help organizers assess the impact of their campaigns in more effective ways. So the research is a multi-year effort where we started building a taxonomy of edit types um, and build an experimental system that can automatically detect edit types at scale for all Wikipedia languages. You can read more about it in the meta page. 
Um, but I want to share with you the taxonomy here. So the taxonomy is actually built. Of course, these taxonomies are, you know, never static. They can improve over time. But at the moment, for those of you who are a little bit further back in the room, I'll read some examples of it. So, for example, we, we, take, we keep track of whether you have edited a table or a reference or categories or added media or external links or templates or white space. Did you add a white space or remove a white space? Um, did you work on a sentence or a paragraph? And on top of these bullet points that you see here, we also consider four types of actions whether you have inserted something, removed something, changed something, or moved something. And this basically gives us a taxonomy of the different types of actions that happen on Wikipedia. We map these, um, this taxonomy to four broad categories that we want to consider. I want to emphasize that the choice of categories uh, depend on what you want to achieve. So actually, we are, our team is very much concerned around the question of how can we support petrollers better in their work. So as you can see, vandalism and petroling has a category because we want to be able to better measure this uh, kind of editing. Content maintenance, content annotation, and content creation are the other categories that we are considering. So we can basically map um, from these more granular edit types to these higher level edit types. So. Now, this is the time that maybe we can play this together. If you have a mobile phone or a laptop in uh, front of you, uh, please go to this link. And uh, I'm going to take, wait maybe for a minute or two while you get there. It's, uh, yeah, uh, what is the best way to get it to you? Is someone on the front uh, on the etherpad and can post it on the etherpad? Actually, let me try to get to the etherpad myself as well. Has anyone made it to the link? Yeah? Okay, perfect. Um, so here is what you can do. So you can basically choose the language that you want to have in the first box. So basically just enter the language code there. And then um, you can skip putting a revision ID. If you don't put it, it will basically randomly assign a revision ID to, to it. If you're curious about a particular revision ID, you can basically add that revision ID there. And then uh, let me just, uh, for the fun of it, I just put EN so that we can hopefully all read. And then you press on submit and it assigns randomly a revision. And then you can start exploring what has happened as a result of this revision um, to Wikipedia. And what you see on the right-hand side is basically the different edit types um, uh, or edit actions that have happened. So there has been an insertion of a white space. Um, there has been a section change, a template insert. Um, if you choose, um, so now I chose the simple option up here. Um, there is a detailed option in which you're going to get much more details about what is the kind of edit that has happened. So you can play with it. Now, of course, this is an interface just... Um, for us all to be able to play with it and get a sense of what it is. But in the back end, basically, we use this kind of taxonomy to be able to do a lot of other things that I'll talk about in the coming slides. Are there any questions about what this thing is doing? Okay, 
then uh, let's move on. So what can we find, um, what can we learn once we can do such a thing? So this is an example. Um, we have started doing analysis based on this data and um, uh, this is French Wikipedia based on data on French Wikimedia preliminary analysis. So what you see on the x-axis, for those of you who are a little bit further back, this is IP editors, 0 to 10 edits, um, users with 0 to 10 edits, users with 10 to 100 edits, and 100 plus edits. And on the y-axis, you have the reverted um, vandalism, reverted patrolling, content annotation, content maintenance, and content generation. And what we see here, if you focus on content generation, is that across the different user types that we have on French Wikipedia, roughly all the user types spend around 20% of their edits on um, creating new content. The rest of the edits are happening on maintenance, annotation, and vandalism detection. So you can interpret these results in different ways, of course. For us, in the research team, given that we know that we want to support the patrollers better, for us, this is a clear sign that we need to better support editors for the work that they're doing on the patrolling and maintenance of content. So this is a clear signal that 80% of the work is happening on maintenance. This is again acknowledged, it's French Wikipedia, it's an established project, it has a lot of content that is you know, already there. So the situation may be very different for a new project or new language project. But for French Wikipedia, what we take from this is 80% of the work is maintenance, annotation, vandalism detection. It's very clear what needs to happen next. We need to support these people for the work that they're doing. Someone else may look at this data and say, oh, we really need more content in this language. Like, let, let's figure out how we can bring more content to the language, right? So, because only 20% of the edits are on the content creation side. And that is okay too, right? Each of us, depending on what, where we sit, what our agendas are, what we, tr what we are trying to achieve, may look at this data and have different interpretation or different ways that we want to engage with this data. And that is okay. Um, that's what makes us a movement with one mission and different ways of arriving at that mission. So I'm going to move away from edit types. Um, any pressing questions on the edit types? Mako. Thanks, Santosh. The, the, the tool seems to give us like very granular information about whether references or headers and these sort of things are had. How do I get from that to content maintenance and content creation? Yeah, um, you should go to the meta page that Isaac has very beautifully documented. And there he's gonna explain to you uh, behind the scenes for the mapping. Yes. Okay, then let's move on to the next thing. Uh, let's move on to newcomer onboarding. There are a couple of things you're going to hear from me if there's enough time about newcomers. Uh, one of them is about hyperlink recommendation. So basically, generally, the problem that the growth team at the foundation uh, posed to the research team was that we want to help newcomers be productive contributors to the projects. And we have figured out through different studies and experiments that giving newcomers structured tasks can help them do things on the project and kind of find their feet and become a little bit more confident. So what we want you to do is to give us kind of structured tasks that you can automatically generate across many different languages that are relatively accurate. They can't be all over the place. And we're gonna give these to newcomers through what they call the newcomer dashboard that is active in many Wikipedia languages right now. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about this. Sorry, I started already talking about the problem. Um, so we initially made uh, what we call a hyperlink re recommendation model. Um, this is a model that looks at the already, the text of the article that is already there and recommends, you, recommends to you which hyperlink to be added on the anchor text that is already in the page of the article. So we um, initially developed the model. That model was in 20 languages. The growth team did some experiments and they came to us and they said, we need this in many more. So part of the effort over the past year has been um, on building for more languages. So we, we have trained model for the model for 297 languages. Um, there's a fabricator task that you, know, you can go to and learn more about. And 
these models are currently being deployed in 185 Wikipedias, although Martin, who is just about to walk out, um, has uh, educated me about the fact that um, what we, when we say deployed, there are different layers of deployment, and until you see it actually on your Wikipedia, it can take some time. Um, the research is published, um, so there's a research behind it, there's a team behind it, and there's an output API. If you're a developer, you can go there and play with it. For the purpose of this conversation, I'm not going to spend time on the API. Um, and instead, I am uh, I'm going to encourage us to try it and see how it works. Um, now, again, I think I need to somehow get to the Etherpad so that I can uh, copy-paste. So if one of you can tell me what is the link to the Etherpad, email me or something. That would be great. No, Tillman cannot. <laughs> You're wondering about it. Can you make an easy one? Oh, actually, why don't I just make one? Hold on a second. There should be one attached to the session, but... Uh... Okay, how about we do... Okay. So if you can go to Etherpad, um, then p slash uh, wikimania2023, the w is uppercase, underscore research, r is double, no, sorry, um, uppercase. So wikimania2023, underscore, and then research. Okay, I don't see any wonder, so I may have said something wrong. etherpad.wikimedia.org slash p slash wikimania2023, w is uppercase, underscore research. Okay, now three people are in, four, perfect. Somebody removed the link. <laughs> put it back. <laughs> I can put it back, that's okay. Perfect. Okay, so if you click on the link, uh, uh, I put it back on Etherpad. Are you there? Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, all good. Try, yeah. Uh, okay, so you go here, and then if you go to test. Dot, actually, I should have just said this from the start. Uh, sorry, I had forgotten that. <laughs> I didn't know it's that easy. So if you go to test.wikimedia.org, test.wikipedia.org, um, log in, you can go to your preferences. You have seen this before, right? Yeah. Um, and then go to editing. And there's an option you can enable, which is about add a link, a newcomer dashboard. Has anyone made it there? Doesn't show me the option. Okay, so this one didn't go as successfully. So let me just leave it at this and say, try it. Uh, if you go there, activate the newcomer dashboard and getting recommendations, hyperlink, add a link recommendations. Then once you go to your newcomer dashboard, what you will see is basically recommendations for articles. You enter the article and then it will recommend hyperlinks to be added. It's on test.wikipedia.org uh, in this particular link that you go to. So the edits that you do, do there don't end up in Wikipedia, but there are in some of the languages, it is already activated. So you can test it also in your language. Um, so, yes. Yeah, 
I mean, I, I'm not a newcomer, so I don't have the newcomer option because I have a user page. Uh, most of the people who has been around has a user page, so we don't see the newcomer. But it would be great to actually have this. Wouldn't it be, I, I know that it's another department, but wouldn't it be great to have like this somehow when you click your user page or something like that? I don't know how, but... Uh... Yeah, I, I, so this is a product decision, of course, right, as you say. Um, however, I'll say, sitting in research and seeing some of the challenges uh, my colleagues have, I think it would be um, nice to give them that feedback. Do you want to have this kind of technology available to you as an editor? They may have options in uh, your bask, right? It's not me, it's I understand. For everyone, yeah, I think generally what I would, actually one, one theme that I would say is that I would like all of us to be more open to experimentation. Um, so if we can do that, if we, ha if we find ways that we can do that in a way that like, you know, we don't break the system in bad ways, I think it's just gonna help all of us um, in the work that we do. Yeah. Actually. Okay, I am gonna be corrected. Okay, actually it's already working. So okay. on the Hungarian Wikipedia, for example, if you click on your user page, then it will go to the newcomer page and you have to specifically want, so there is, there is a link to visit your user page. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not a new user, right. don't get me wrong. So it's technically possible. I don't know how it's settled. I mean, what's, what's the settings, but it, it's working. Right, and I think the point is like, what if you don't, your workflow does not include like going to a newcomer page, right? Receiving this kind of recommendation from other places would also be nice, right? Suppose you're, editing with visual editor and I can tell you, oh, do you want to receive some link recommendations, right? That would, that could also be nice. But it's great to see that it's working already for you in Hungarian, perfect. Um, okay, so the, sorry, the learning that I wanted to share with you here is a technical learning, but an important one because I want you to know that we deeply care about bringing these types of technologies to many languages and it results in a ton of work that needs to happen behind the scenes for doing that and doing that accurately. Particularly, it is very hard to split sentences in Wikipedia across languages. Um, sounds like a very obvious problem. It's a problem that is not solved by the natural language processing community because many people really don't care. It's not our, on their top priority to solve this problem for 300, 2,000 whatever languages that exist in the world, right? So when researchers run into this problem, they usually opt for choosing NLP packages for the languages that already the package is working well. So we see it as part of our responsibility to fix this problem, right? So of course, because it's our mandate, we have to be accessible to and equitable across many projects. But I want you to know that, you know, each of these technologies, when we bring it to 300 languages, there's a ton of work that's happening behind the scenes, particularly like simple stuff. How do we know that a sentence has ended is very different. So in Bengali, very is used. Armenian does a different thing. Um, just we have a way to, un we need to have a way to understand where is the end of a sentence to be able to do these kind of things automatically. And that actually takes us to uh, the next one. I think if I have, uh, yes. So basically the challenge that we ran into in the question uh, in, in the previous research on link recommendation was that we, don't, we didn't have a good way. Once they told us they wanna go from 20 languages to 300, we were like, oh my God, we don't even know what is a sentence like in these languages, right? So a new area of research opened, which is around making Wikipedia's textual data more easily usable by researchers and, and developers. So focus on the text can we break it down in ways that actually these machines, tools can process it in better ways? Um, so I, I talked about the problem already in the previous place. Basically people, the issue is that NLP packages that exist don't solve this problem for the languages. And if they attempt to do it, they do a poor quality. So we can't use it for Wikipedia purposes. If we can solve this problem, it will allow us to solve many other problems. So it's one of those kind of unlocking um, uh, problems like add a link, for example, for the newcomer uh, dashboard and also for the edit type library. So uh, we now do have a package um, that can split Wikipedia content across 300 plus languages. It was a tremendous amount of work. Congratulations to the team for making this happen, but we have it now. There are a few ex exceptions such as Thai, in Thai language where we have not figured out basically there is no signal for ending of a sentence. And we don't know what to do yet, but we are trying. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so we have a relatively uniform way for doing this. This means if you give the machine now um, a sentence from a language, it can, multiple sentences, it can first of all break it down to sentences, and it can also break down the sentence into words, tokenize the words, so that we know this thing is a word. Um, and uh, we can do that. Um, yeah, I mean, the finding here is that languages are hard, right? And we really demand a lot. And, you know, our team um, really it, is it, it's an absolute privilege to be in this position to serve the movement in this way. However, let us not forget that each time we talk about adding a language and bringing equity in terms of what we offer in different languages, these these are hard. These are hard tasks, and each of them will require significant, sometimes, um, not each of them, but many of them require significant amount of deliberation and thinking. And, you know, when we build a package, we can't just build it and put it out there. We need to evaluate it, and we need to make sure actually it works before we put it, you know, in front of people. Um, and the fact that, you know, let's keep in mind that NLP and AI community has forgotten the languages. The priority is on specific languages, larger languages with more speakers, um, and we see as our responsibility, and this is actually some of the things that we also try to um, raise awareness about within the research community, and also provide data sets to encourage them to kind of do this more of this kind of work. Okay, languages. Um, any question about the tokenization of sentences and words? Yes. Um, I'm just, Probably, if you can, if you can say um, how, how were the differences when you were doing this research among the languages, because they are really, as you mentioned, completely different. There are different structures. So, um, probably, can you can you tell, like, uh, in my case, it would be Arabic relevant for <laughs> to, to know probably how difficult was it there, and probably, but you could generalize the answer. If right. So. Um, I can't answer your question because I didn't do the research, so I don't know the details about Arabic. What I can do is that I can, if you can send me an email, I can just follow up and send you the, there is a fabricator task where we track about the quality and how it's done, like in different languages. And I know right to left languages have their own challenge. Um, so I can just share that with you, but I don't know it to be able to answer. Yeah. Um, okay, um, another favorite topic, um, supporting organizers with list building uh, for campaigns. So this is, of course, a long-term request. If you have been an organizer, you have spent time creating lists for the campaign that you want to organize. This has been flagged for many years. I've been in this movement for almost 10 years, always as a problem by organizers. Um, so we want to help organizers um, with the list building problem. Now, um, uh, list building is hard, is manual, is time consuming, and we want to support organizers. Um, if we can solve this problem, then of course, you know, it's time saved, right? Things are more efficient on the organizer end. They can decide to sleep a little bit longer or do other types of work that, um, that uh, their creativity can be uh, better used at. Um, and the other thing that I want to say is that, like, on, on the topic of campaigns, because we're focusing on campaigns, and, you know, there are always a lot of discussions about campaigns and values of, like, editor retention, newcomers. We, in our team, see the value of campaigns um, as a multifaceted type of activity on the movement. So we generally know that it's something that is important for the movement, many organized campaigns. We have also seen that they can create a lot of energy and focus which is a sign that campaigns can be really excellent ways for bringing people to the movement or help, helping them become contributors or continue to contribute. And the last thing is that they're an important social aspect of the movement. So this is also important for us. So for when we decide whether we work on this problem, this is you know, a very soci socio-technical and social movement. And we know that campaigns are uh, social um, activators within our movement. Um, so. We want to do list building, and there are a lot of opinions about how we can do list building. So for example, you can look at the readership of a Wikipedia article, and you can see if readers are coming to a Wikipedia article, what other pages are they reading? And from that similarity of what they are looking for, you can look for whether um, you want to combine those types of articles as things that are of the same kind. You can look at the content of the article, you can look at search, um, Wikipedia search, you can use that and find like similar articles. And we did some research to understand which one is better, 
which one of these many approaches? And the answer, unfortunately, that we found is that no one approach is better. We will gain a lot by combining these different approaches. So that's what we did. We're combining multiple approaches to basically create a fusion of different methods for creating lists for campaigns. The research documentation, again, is in, in, in this place. You can go and check it out. Um, and now we get to something that maybe you can try. So I'm going to try it this time, putting on the famous etherpad that we have. It's on list-building.toolforge.org. Uh, okay, so if you go here, you can, again, enter the language code um, and then enter a page title and then say how many results you want to get. So here the task in, in this experimental setup is that you give an article as an organizer and then you're going to get similar articles to this article and that can help you, for example, figure out which articles are similar and you want to um, include in your campaign. Uh, we are working on a parallel piece of technology related to this, which is helping organizers find editors um, that may be existing editors who may be interested based on, you know, similarity between edits and um, uh, to be included in campaigns. Um, but you can, you can play with this. Um, so if one of you have a, has a suggestion for an article that I can say on English Wikipedia, maybe something not super exciting. if you can break this. Um, okay, so I put Wonder Woman. Okay, if you're starting the query, it's loading. We wait. Uh, one thing while we're waiting for it is that um, uh, I'm going to share the finding, which is this is actually going to reveal, it is not very trivial what is similar to another thing in, in, a, in a Wikipedia article. So if you look at the recommendations as they come up, you find, you find sometimes curious things in it. So last night I searched for rat and then like I found like some cat articles there, right? And they're clearly not exactly about rat, but it's just like um, keep your mind open as you're interacting with it um, because it can give you sometimes um, curious things. Um, and of course, if you have feedback about it, provide it. Um, I can't get anything. Has anyone got something interacting with it? Yeah? I don't know. For, for some reason, this doesn't come up for me. Okay. So if you've seen it, some of you at least, then... Oh, okay. Now it's here. Wonder Woman. Um, okay, Kate. I think you need to help me here. Uh, Amazon's DC Comics, Superman, John Constantine, Catwoman, Trial of the Amazons. <laughs> so stay curious. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and again, uh, we're, uh, of course, working with the campaign team at the Wikimedia India Foundation. This eventually is going to become something that, you know, you can use in the pr proper places, in uh, proper ways that you interact with. This is just like a tool that we try to usually, you know, as soon as we get to a piece of technology that we can put in front of others, we try to set up uh, a page here so that at least people can interact with it um, and give us feedback. So the finding I already shared with you, stay curious. You sometimes find new things as you look at it. So we have a... a Around 10 minutes left, so let's see how far we can go. Um, I want to talk about newcomers and tenured editors in this case, uh, going back to the question of um, what if you're a tenured ed editor. And this is about image recommendations. So what is the problem? The problem is that more than 50% of Wikipedia articles don't have any image in them. Um, and uh, what we also know is that this is ongoing line of research, but parts of it we know. That is, images help readers understand to some extent, 
navigate and also engage with the with the content of the articles. So readers tend to use images to contextualize the text that is uh, available to them. Again, um, this is ongoing. There's a lot of unknowns in this space, like how do readers actually learn from images? But it's uh, we, we see some signals on this front. Um, in the past years, we had developed two sets of algorithms on the images front. One, um, sorry, two sets of algorithms that we are now combining. So we had one algorithm that given a Wikipedia article would tell you what image can be added to this Wikipedia article or what set of images. And we had another algorithm that we developed for the content translation um, product. Um, and the job of that algorithm was to align sections across Wikipedia languages. Because if you have worked with content translation, um, basically if you if you want to edit a section, you ne it needs to give you the corresponding section in an article. So we needed to align articles across, align sections across uh, languages. So we brought these two algorithms together for this case, and we are doing image recommendation at the section level. So um, it's a little bit more granular. It helps the editor better, particularly because newcomers are involved. If you just give them a very long article and just say, add something, it can be tricky. So we want to actually be able to recommend at the section level. And that is what this piece of uh, technology does. Um, this pilot is, uh, there's a pilot happening for testing this. And this is happening in Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, and Czech. So if you're in any of these languages, you may interact with it. Um, uh, this is for newcomers, but of course you can see it in your newcomer dashboard. Um, and there are uh, six other, uh, six languages that are experiencing this through the structured data across Wikimedia uh, project. Um, I'm going to maybe skip this one. This is basically, yeah, you can, if you are in these projects, you can go to your newcomer dashboard and test it. Um, so the way this algorithm works is relatively simplistic. What we are doing is that we are not going to comments and searching for everything. What we are doing is that we are looking at Wikipedia itself across the many different languages, and we are find we are looking for which language which language for a particular article has used what image, and we are using those images that are already being used as a pool for recommending to an editor in a given language. The advantage of this is that there's less risk. Most likely, that um, that image has been checked by someone by an editor in another language. The disadvantage is that we may propagate biases, right? So it's very important to keep in mind as we're recommending things to editors that we, we make them aware that there's a machine that is recommending, this machine can make mistakes, there can be biases. So there's a lot of human judgment that needs to go in place. But at the, at the very least, for some of the obvious things, people can benefit from propagating knowledge in this way from one language to another. Okay, I have almost seven minutes left. I want to definitely cover this one. Uh, this is a very exciting one. Um, so the issue that we are seeing is that some articles are much less visible than others. Um, almost 15% of all Wikipedia articles are orphans. These are articles that are not linked to from any other um, article. Um, a good chunk of these articles are disambiguation pages, for example, which is okay. They can be orphans, and that's fine. But a lot of them are not of disambiguation or the, the other types. So there's actually a problem here that we are creating articles that we are not connecting to the rest of the network of Wikipedia. Now, um, the problem is particularly tricky because what we are seeing is that biographies of women are disproportionately less connected, and they are um, they're making up a large chunk of the orphan articles. So in English Wikipedia, 28% of the orphan articles are biographies of women. Uh, in Spanish Wikipedia, this is 35%, and the last one is Catalan Wikipedia, which is 42%. So there is work to be done here, and I want to encourage all of you who are in the space of you know, we should support you, and we're, we have seen this. We are going to work on technologies to help support this and like address this. But also, if you're in the, you know, if your focus is creating content, um, particularly content around biographies of women, please keep in mind and encourage people that if you're creating an, an article, make sure that it's not orphan and it's connected. 
And why this is important? Because, of course, everyone can go outside of Wikipedia and search for something and come back. But a lot of readers also do serendipitous search on Wikipedia, and they try to get from one topic to another. And if the article is not connected, it is really not a good, there's no good way. I mean, in theory, you can search, but again, like it's not serendipitous, right? Because you don't know the person um, that you're trying to reach. Um, so I wanna encourage all of you to talk with all of your friends who are in this space and just let's make sure the biographies of women are not orphan and can be connected. And of course, everything else that is orphan and can be connected. Um, this, um, the study is done on 319 Wikipedia languages, and we see this problem kind of persistent across the languages, so it's not like you know one or two language. Um, so we have measured basically the extent of this kind of uh, gap, and we have also done a quasi-experiment in which we have shown that if you add the link, the page views for that article will increase significantly. So there's value in doing that because actually people can find it. Intuitively, of course, we know it, but also the data supports this. Um, and I think the last thing I wanna mention, I, I said I think um, pretty much everything that is in this slide, but I wanna just also highlight the issue of structural biases that may exist, right? This was not something that we expected. Uh, we kind of ran into this uh, problem as we were doing some other studies and then we were like, oh, wait a minute, what's happening here? Why are there so many orphan articles? And it's something, it, it, it's a reminder that we need to be aware of the structural biases that may exist and they may affect particular groups, particular topics in specific ways. And I think, um, yeah, there's a tool, you can go try it out. Um, I have put an example um, for, uh, for, we have put an example, um, I'm gonna put it on the etherpad and you can try it with this. You don't have to, of course, try it with this particular example. It, it is just that, um, if the article that you enter is not orphaned, then you're not gonna get anything, right? So um, this particular one, somebody may eventually de-orphanize it, but until then. Okay. Um, and I'll let you play maybe with that if you choose to outside of this session. Given that we have a couple of minutes left, I would like to go to the last slide to say that, you know, Wikimania, Wikimania is an amazing opportunity for me and my team to connect with you, of course, like through uh, me in, uh, in this particular occasion because the rest of the team was not able to attend. Uh, but this is not the only opportunity. This is, you know, just to reinforce the connections and help you be aware of the work that is happening within the Wikimedia Foundation to support you. If throughout the year you want to be in touch, we have monthly office hours. The link for it is there. You can book a one-on-one -on -one session with a member of the research team and talk with us about anything. If you go to that page, uh, it is clear who is active in which part of the programs and you can just choose to talk to us. You can book it. I highly encourage you to do that. We are here to serve you. And if it helps to have a conversation, we are here for you. We have monthly research showcases. If you want to dig deeper on specifics of like research and the research world, of course, you're welcome to. Um, you can always go to research.wikimedia.org to learn about the latest that is happening uh, on the research end. And of course, there's a public mailing list. And uh, uh, now that Tillman is here, he's going to remind me of the Twitter wiki research handle, Mastodon, yeah, Twitter X, whatever we call it these days. Um, and the research newsletter. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm happy I have around one minute. So to take your questions. Thanks for hanging in here and playing with us. Everything was very clear. You have 40 seconds back. Thank you. And see you in the party. <laughs>